you can run other applications on the Bitcoin satellites themselves besides simply the blockchain itself and broadcast. You can have oracles that are triggered off of the blockchain in space. So you're literally having an autonomous bot running on this satellite and it's triggered not by a remote ping from a protocol, but some events on the blockchain protocol. Hello, welcome to episode 26 of The Bitcoin Game. I'm Rob Mitchell. Back some months ago, Los Angeles had its first Bitcoin conference ever, called The State of Digital Money. The featured speaker was Bitcoin core developer Jeff Garzik. Jeff's presentation was called The Future of Bitcoin. You may even find it refreshing to hear a core developer speak on a variety of Bitcoin topics without having to weigh in on the contentious block size debate. So relax and enjoy this presentation by Jeff Garzik. You'll find links to topics he discusses, the slides for this talk, and video of this talk all in the show notes. Just go to thebitcoingame.com and look for episode 26. Here's Jeff. All right, uh, I'm Jeff Garzik. I am uh, the CEO of Dunvegan Space Systems. I am here wearing my CEO costume and not my hacker costume. And I'm also the uh, Bitcoin core developer at BitPay. Let's see if we go up or down. Okay, so is 2015 the make or break year for Bitcoin? Absolutely neither. It is a long road and we're really just at the beginning. And I want to take you through some examples and demonstrate that. Um, standard disclaimer is uh, just like a startup business, risky, etc. Bitcoin is a startup currency. I would not recommend putting your entire life savings into it. It is still an experimental currency, even though we uh, put every effort into information security, stability, etc. Motivation. What was my motivation getting into uh, Bitcoin? Well, it was uh, honestly uh, rooted in science fiction. In science fiction, you don't have, uh, you know, planet bucks. You don't have U.S. dollars or yen, etc. You just have a credits. You know, there's no nation state boundaries. It's just a global money that they describe in science fiction. And so everyone's equal before that currency. It's just universal. Um, the second motivation was similar to why I got into Linux, which was what I did before Bitcoin. I was, uh, if uh, anyone in the audience uh, has an Android phone, you're running my code. Um, I used to do, uh, hey, there you go, all right. Um, I used to uh, work on the Linux kernel, and uh, I was uh, communicating directly with Linus Torvalds, et cetera, during that time. And the reason that I got involved in Linux was to really open the developing world to software. In uh, the late 90s, you had uh, Windows license fees and all sorts of barriers to actually educating young, underprivileged students. And Linux and open source had a distinct advantage in cracking that open. And similarly with Bitcoin, uh, one of my key motivations for getting into Bitcoin is not necessarily the Western world, but the unbanked, the people that don't have access to bank accounts that I do, that don't have access to the credit cards that I do. And it's quite clear that Bitcoin and Bitcoin-like technology can enable that. All you need is a feature phone. You don't even need an internet connection. And you can transact Bitcoin. So that's really transformational for billions upon billions on this planet today. And so uh, my point of discovery, I got involved in Bitcoin in July of 2010. I call it the great slash dotting, where it was uh, one of the first times that slash.org covered the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem, the software, etc. And I approached it as a Bitcoin skeptic. I looked at uh, the initial description. I said, this is completely impossible. Uh, how can I have a computer file on my computer that's worth $20? And I copy it to my father's computer. And how did I not just counterfeit some money? How did I not just double spend? And obviously, Bitcoin solved that problem. And being open source, you can actually look under the hood and see how it solved that problem and prove to yourself that it is indeed secure. So before we tackle Bitcoin in the future, I want to tackle Bitcoin today. Um, there will be some techno babble, but uh, we'll get through it. Um, first, 
you know, sort of the first four years or so of Bitcoin, I would describe as sort of amateur hour. It's uh, a programmer getting into something which is really a financial institution. You can be your own financial institution with all the great and wonderful uh, things that come with it and also the mistakes that come along with do-it-yourself approaches. And so uh, that was one of the reasons why uh, Tony and Steven started BitPay a long time ago was that rather than ever everyone individually creating their own payment processing uh, solution that really you want to go with a trusted, time-tested solution. So that's uh, what BitPay uh, payment processing offers. Obviously, GoCoin as well, they kick ass too, and uh, several other payment options. But uh, basically, Bitcoin in its early life was really programmers who were, in my frank and humble opinion, not qualified to secure millions of dollars in wealth against determined attackers. And so from that point of view, you, you really had a very sort of early life of Bitcoin where many Bitcoins were stolen because it was poorly secured on the user side and uh, on the website side where users would trust these programmers building Bitcoin websites and that trust was actually misplaced. So in 2014, 2015, 15, we are finally seeing the maturation of all these systems. We're finally seeing that uh, amateur hour is a little bit over. So a monetary snapshot of Bitcoin, Bitcoin today, um, they're in circulation 14 million with a market cap of over 3 billion. Obviously that's uh, down from its heyday. Um, Daily, there is, this is uh, for you technical minded, this includes change transactions. Uh, transfers 180 million in value per day. Um, the hash power is, uh, that's uh, converted into something that sort of people can understand and compare with petaflops. Uh, the hash power of the Bitcoin network is 77,000 times more powerful than the world's most powerful supercomputer. And so when you, you hear about altcoins, you hear about these other chains, et cetera, you've got to think those guys from the get-go, out of the gate, they have to create a system that is secure as something 77,000 times more powerful than a supercomputer. So that's the hurdle that any Bitcoin competitor has to ascend simply to be secure against Bitcoin. Bitcoin community snapshot, uh, this gives you some uh, idea of the uh, people behind it. You've got uh, venture capital is uh, continuing to grow. I think that uh, we're probably going to exceed $1 billion in venture capital by the end of this year. Um, the Angelus count is uh, about 512 Bitcoin related companies. Um, the wallet count and those uh, for you uh, metrics laden people. Those are total wallets and not active wallets. Um, Two million in Coinbase, three million in blockchain. Um, Reddit subscribers, the developer repositories is an interesting um, metric to track. That's really the developer engagement in Bitcoin and that's something that, uh, that's a hockey stick graph that just keeps going straight up. Um, P2P network nodes uh, on the other side of the graph, that is something that is uh, trending downward, which is not a uh, good direction, but uh, probably a bit inevitable as the network scales up. So uh, a new version of Bitcoin was released a few months ago towards the beginning of the year. Uh, what are some of the new things in there? Um, number one, uh, some of the, you know, this is mostly sort of the techno babble that I warned you about, but... Uh, Headers first synchronization. This is something that makes Bitcoin faster than BitTorrent. Um, you, uh, for, and also more secure as well. Um, smart transaction fees. The uh, core software, the wallet, looks at a history of blocks and determines uh, how little a fee you need to pay in order to get the transaction confirmed as you need. Um, here's a, uh, this uh, third bullet point is very exciting. Unlimited P2SH script flexibility. And uh, basically right now on the network, there are a, like three or four specific types of transaction templates that you can send on the network and it's whitelisted and all the other transaction possibilities, scripts, et cetera, they're blacklisted and prevented from being relayed on the network. Now, what this change does is for a uh, redemption 
script. It basically means that you can do any script that's possible in Bitcoin now with this new release. So uh, you may have heard of multisig. You can do even more complex uh, groupings, such as you can say this group and this group, and then the value is transferred. Or you can say this person or this group. If you're familiar with programming, you can create arbitrarily complex Boolean logic, arbitrarily complex evaluations for who can redeem that specific set of Bitcoins. Some other features, uh, we have a, a browser, uh, like a blockchain browser specific API makes that uh, nicer. Watch only wallets where you don't have to uh, store the actual private key to watch your balance. And uh, something that uh, the Blockstream folks are helping out with is a consensus library so that you don't have to reinvent Bitcoin every single time you want an alternate implementation. You just link with this core code and then the rest is your own. Today's magic word is beer. B E E R. Use the magic word and claim your share of this week's listener reward of LTB coin on Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. Follow me on Twitter at the BTC Game because I'll be asking some questions related to this episode. The first person to tweet the correct answer wins their choice of either a classic Bitcoin keychain or the new Bitcoin fork pin. For more information about the Bitcoin fork pin, go to bitcoinforks.com. For more information about the classic Bitcoin keychain, go to bkeychain.com. So what's coming tomorrow? Got to take a drink first. It's beer o'clock. Um, basically, the reason why it, Bitcoin is not going to succeed or fail in 2015 is because we are just at the bottom of that pyramid today. The services that are built on top of Bitcoin are just now being constructed, and those are going to be rolled out over the next months and years. And so from that perspective, you know, if you're building a pyramid and someone says, after you reach the first level, have you succeeded or failed? You know, it's a non-question because you haven't even gotten to the completion of the project. To be a little bit more specific, um, I draw an analogy between Bitcoin as it is today, which is a one-way irreversible uh, transfer, and let's see if the laser pointer works. So we're right here in the Bitcoin world. And we have these layers above, like TCP at the network layer. What that does is it makes sure that just in case a network message gets dropped, delayed, corrupted, etc., it'll come back and it'll retry it. It'll make sure that you have a uh, you have full integrity of your data. Similarly, we are going to see in the future layers built on top of Bitcoin right there that are going to provide as opt-in, it's not, not a, a change in fundamental Bitcoin, but you'll have reversible layers that you can opt into. You'll have layers that guarantee that the funds have arrived and you confirm those before the actual transactions occur. You'll have, and I'm going to show this on the next slide, you'll have layers which provide instant secure Bitcoin transactions. So you don't need to look at an alternate system. You can just use the official protocol itself. So... We are really in the early days of Bitcoin because we are just at the lowest layer today. Now, when, uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of the inspirations for myself getting into Bitcoin was science fiction. And what is sort of the theoretical perfect currency that you would like? It's instant, it's secure, and uh, it's just as trustless as Bitcoin itself. Now, payment, te uh, payment channels is a technology that sits on top of Bitcoin. It's perfectly compatible with Bitcoin, does not require any changes at all. And that technology, payment channels, provides instant, secure, trustless transactions. It's an open protocol. Um, it's uh, going, uh, illustrating uh, right here. It sits on top of the uh, Bitcoin network itself. Well, 
There are two specific projects that are working on that right now. One of them you can Google for is the Lightning Network, and the other one is the uh, Impulse Protocol that I uh, had a little bit of uh, input on. So uh, how do payment channels work? How do they look, et cetera? Um, they're basically, they are trustless, but uh, you, if you have a specially updated wallet to understand this new payment protocol, this second layer protocol, then you can have a scenario where a customer makes, say, an instant secure payment to Lyft, and that customer is secure against BitPay stealing the funds because since this is on the blockchain, BitPay is never actually holding those funds. And therefore, we have reduced legal liability. And on the customer and Lyft side, you have the reduced chance that uh, either you know, there'll be some malfeasance, some software bugs, whatever. You reduce those risks directly. Um, you're not uh, Lyft and BitPay on the other side, uh, since this is uh, a normal Bitcoin transaction, are secure against customer clawback. However, um, and this is the uh, sort of rollout barrier, is that all these are additional protocols and therefore you have to teach your wallet software everything about that protocol. So right now you can't use payment channels, but that's only a software update type of uh, issue. There's no fundamental barriers. Um, there are many more sort of layer two type services that are coming out in the future that will uh, benefit Bitcoin. Um, the first one is uh, BIP65, otherwise uh, known by its technical name of Check Lock Time Verify. And uh, in uh, the, the sort of direct parlance, basically what it does is it locks funds on the blockchain and you cannot move them until a certain time. You cannot move them if you're under duress and there's a gun to your head. You cannot move them if you really, really want to. Um, it's literally the protocol prevents fund movement for a specified time, and you specify that time. So that, that makes some interesting use cases for both cold storage. You can literally store Bitcoin on the blockchain and no one, including you, can move it until that specific time. This is also useful as a building piece for the payment channel technology and similar technologies whereby you can assure that certain funds are committed to a transaction for a certain amount of time. And uh, that, in game theory perspective, reduces the risk of someone else cheating you. If they had to put down a deposit and lock their own funds for, say, a day in order to transact with you. This is also, uh, people have proposed using this for anti spam. For example, you could lock uh, a dollar's worth of Bitcoin on the blockchain, and you'll get that dollar back in 24 hours or whatever the protocol says, but you have committed value and opportunity cost to the blockchain, and you can get something in return. For example, a, uh, you know, an anti-spam type uh, technology can look at that and say, yes, he committed some value, so I will give him rights to this instant message system in return. Um, some other use cases, uh, this has been around since uh, Bitcoin is, uh, was created, but no one has really started to take advantage of it until now, is that uh, semi-trusted escrow. Today, if you use a normal escrow agent, uh, you know, for example, a real estate transaction, when I purchased my house, I had to leave a uh, large chunk of money in escrow with the real estate attorney. With Bitcoin, what you do is that is stored on the blockchain itself, whereby you can let the buyer and the seller, if they agree, unlock that. Or if the buyer and seller do not agree, it goes to that third party in that trusted escrow, the arbitrator. And so it's much more of a pure function. That arbitrator can be a robot. That arbitrator can be utterly unconnected with the transaction until they come in. And why that is useful is normally, again, with funds being held, you have risk of theft, you have risk of loss, et cetera, if you're, as the escrow agent, holding funds. Well, Bitcoin totally upends that risk profile because escrow no longer needs to actually hold funds. You're just being that key decision maker in which direction the escrow transaction should go towards the buyer or towards the seller. Um, 
This uh, next uh, bullet harkens back to some of the earlier panels. Is uh, this is where I really believe the uh, the future of Bitcoin is going to go? Is uh, with all these stock trades, smart property, all this other uh, Bitcoin 2.0 type stuff. Is ultimately it's going to be on a separate chain simply because, uh, for example, uh, you wouldn't want to store all Microsoft stock trades on the blockchain. It's just utterly ridiculous. But what you will do is you will secure a separate chain in the main Bitcoin blockchain because of that uh, hash power right there. Is that any other competitor, again, getting into the Bitcoin space, they are either going to be wildly insecure in terms of proof of work. For example, Litecoin is literally over a million times less secure than Bitcoin. Or you're going to a separate system like proof of stake, where you basically sort of put the central bankers in place at the very beginning of the chain's lifetime. And it's essentially a pre-mine from there. So that, that's sort of the, prob the major problem with uh, Next. So, uh, so we'll have uh, uh, side chains and more. It's not specifically side chains. Side chains will be part of the entire picture. There'll be merge mine chains. There'll be uh, BitPay is working on something called ChainDB, which is a totally separate technology from side chains, but it does something very similar. And ultimately, the key is all these chains are borrowing Bitcoin security because there is literally, you know, no other secure chain on the planet compared to comparatively. So you'll see non-currency chains, you'll see uh, other uh, financial chains, etc. And uh, lastly, you'll see uh, the ledger being used for assets other than tokens. Because really, uh, Bitcoin is sort of an MVP. It's the minimum viable product. It's the, the smallest system that Satoshi could create that he could prove would work, he could prove would grow. But that was always just the initial step, the first step. Up. Now, uh, for example, Satoshi had built in a decentralized market and had designs for decentralized markets. And uh, that was always incomplete, uh, but there were many, many more ideas uh, along those lines. And Bitcoin, the token, was the first step that you had to create in order to create some of these other systems. So, moving uh, towards the science fiction realm and uh, a little bit farther out. Um, this is uh, another project that uh, I am personally working on, uh, Dunvegan Space Systems, dunvaganspace.com, is a network of 24 satellites, and uh, they are all over the globe, and they can reach any part on Earth. You can broadcast the blockchain to anywhere, whether you're off-grid, you're behind a great firewall, or you're uh, being ddos something like that. But uh, that's just sort of the first initial step that we've been talking about in public. Um, some of the other things that uh, I'm mentioning uh, here exclusively are uh, you can run other applications on the Bitcoin satellites themselves besides simply the blockchain itself and broadcast. Um, you can have oracles that are triggered off of the blockchain in space. So you're literally having an autonomous bot running on this satellite satellite, and it's triggered not by a remote ping from a protocol, but some events on the blockchain protocol. Um, you have worldwide broadcasts, as I mentioned, and uh, ultimately, the rubric of Dunvegan Space Systems moves far beyond Bitcoin itself to really building the physical, virtual, and the financial infrastructure to enable space settlement. And uh, enabling space settlement, in part, you get to things like space banks, space corporations, uh, DAOs running in space, and that sort of thing. So that's the network that we're going to build. Uh, the technical term for that is a birdcage orbit, and that's uh, 24 satellites covering all of the land masses on Earth. Some of the, uh, some of the oceans you won't get uh, good reception. 
So other uh, sort of not so, not so near term type things, uh, supply chains. Once you have much more of the supply chain uh, infrastructure and logistical infrastructure on blockchain technology, then you can posit some real time supply chain optimizations such that, you know, to the point where you might have an ocean going ship that's headed for the port of Los Angeles and then it gets a bid and all of a sudden it's, you know, monetarily it has to, to work economically, but uh, it ch changes course and goes to uh, the port of Savannah or something like that. Um, and moving either and even farther, af farther afield is uh, something that uh, I urge you to uh, Google for, um, Mike Hearn Turing Festival 2013 on YouTube. It's a uh, fascinating 30-minute uh, video and it uh, covers a concept that uh, Mike Hearn calls TradeNet. And it's really, Mike is just summarizing a, uh, a common concept that most of us have had since the beginning of Bitcoin, is really you're going to have a lot of decentralized markets and not just a human participating in these markets, you'll have machines participating in these markets. And uh, to make this uh, sort of uh, vague description a little bit more concrete, Concrete. Imagine that you're in a park, and uh, you know you're having a good time with your significant others and friends, etc. And you're kind of thirsty, and you'd like a beer. I'd like a beer. So you pull out your smartphone and you order a beer, and the payment technology blockchain based obviously, uh, goes to this decentralized market and uh, your bid for a beer goes into another market and eventually it signals a drone and it says, hey, this guy in the middle of this park wants a beer. So your drone fall, you know, flies over, it airdrops your beer right into your hand and you're very happy. Now, your friends, they're jealous. They didn't get a beer. They didn't get an airdropped beer. So they pull out their smartphones and they order beers as well. Now, what's happening behind the scenes, again, this is all going into a bigger marketplace. Now, a, either a machine or a human notices, hey, there is a whole lot of beer drinkers in this park all of a sudden. Um, this is a market opportunity. So instead of sending a drone to deliver 40 beers, uh, some enterprising robot or person sends a drone to drop a vending machine full of beer. And thereby, you have a great profit-making opportunity, your consumers are satisfied, and in the back end, what you've seen is a decentralized market in action, is that all of this is really behind the scenes, and that's what the future of ultimately Bitcoin itself is. You're not going to, in 10 years' time, uh, ask someone for their Bitcoin address and then send money to their Bitcoin address. That's, quite frankly, a horrible user experience today, and uh, that needs to be edited out of the system permanently. So that's what we mean when Bitcoin is going to be payment rails and uh, the payment back end is that in the back end, it's all using Bitcoin and blockchain technology to power all this, but your user experience is basically very simplified, very streamlined. It's just going to ask you, you know, do you want uh, to pay $5 for a beer? So that's sort of a quick uh, vision of uh, what's coming down the pipe, both uh, short and long term. And I'd be happy to take any questions. On your space project, can you give an example of some of the applications that, that you might uh, rent the units for? I'd be happy to do that in private, maybe with an NDA. <laughs> that there's significant stealth mode pieces to that. Yes, sir. Uh, two part question. Uh, number one, uh, you know, obviously the talk has been going a lot in the last couple months about Bitcoin, the blockchain. And again, a lot of people say, well, blockchain matters, not Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's built on. I mean, blockchain's built on Bitcoin. Other than these other chains, that you seem to like, you know, like his ability to die. Um, but does this mean Ethereum is dead on arrival, for example? Well, Ethereum is uh, a wonderful project that's flawed for reasons unrelated to technology. 
Um, ultimately, their uh, their ether model and their funding model and stuff like that, and having to pay back investors, and it it drives people drives them to provide value in a single chain. Whereas Ethereum is really more of a programming language that can be applied to Bitcoin, can be applied to any other chain. And so I think that Ethereum's success is really going to be informing sort of how we design Bitcoin in the years to come. There's one concept from Ethereum called active addresses that uh, is coming down the pipe. And active addresses are an address that's on the blockchain that it itself can hold a balance. And it's not unlocked by a public key, it's triggered by sending a transaction to that address. And so it functions very similar to Ethereum, but that technology can be taken out and inserted into Bitcoin or inserted into a Bitcoin sidechain, et cetera. Uh, what was the second part? This has been one that's been bothering me, like not only all day, but for like a couple of months now. Is um, so. Let's say that I agree with the, the precept, which I generally do, that you know the security on Bitcoin is such that's really where the action is going to be at least linked to it, side chains or whatever. Um, and yet we all know that you know it's not fast enough as we've said on the panel to do a lot of like you know tens of millions of uh, transactions per second. Well, payment channels scale up to four billion transactions per second. Sorry. Four billion transactions per second. But Bitcoin can do that. Yes. That, that's new to me. What uh, iteration? Payment channels. They sit on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. And so you have a committed funds transaction, and then you iterate off the blockchain, and then you commit funds back on the blockchain. So the technology can really solve these problems. Yes. Done on Bitcoin. And because everybody's disassociating the, the price of Bitcoin to rapid adoption, um, and you know we've seen certain coins, including Bitcoin, where there's been much more activity. Uh, counterparty, you know, had a lot more activity. You know, prices down ninety percent and things like that. Is there any connection at all these days between the technological improvement and the price in your opinion? Um, well, uh, there is an answer to that, but I have a long-standing policy of never ever commenting on the price. I don't speculate on the price. I don't calculate on the price. I, I just try to focus on the technology. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, so the side chain on Bitcoin 2.0, when will it be available for smart contracts and smart asset returns and real profit assets? Well, uh, and does it work? Uh, as I understand it, uh, the uh, side chains definitely is working in shop. And so it's not, it 100% exists, it 100% works, it's not yet released. But uh, uh, let's see which slide we were at. So yeah, it's, it's really going to be side chains and more. You're going to have, for example, you have Namecoin. I don't see Namecoin going away. And in fact, I see people developing Namecoin. That has absolutely nothing to do with side chains, but it is metaphorically a side chain. And so you're going to see many technologies like that. And uh, referencing again, BitPay's ChainDB as another example is you don't have to have the Blockstream develop sidechain technology to have a side chain. And so what you're going to see is you'll see stock trades on a chain, you'll see uh, ownership of stocks, cars, et cetera, but you don't have to wait for that specific technology. Did that answer your question? Somewhat, I'm still trying to turn. Okay. using side chains then? No. But uh, I, I definitely encourage people to check out, especially the Lightning Network. It's, uh, I got to take a little bit of an ego hit because I worked on Impulse Protocol, but I now think that Lightning is a little bit superior to that. So I encourage uh, everyone to check out the Lightning Network. And uh, Rusty Russell has an excellent uh, summary on his blog about how the Lightning Network works. So uh, rusty.oslabs.org, I think, is the site address. Uh, all the way in the back. So there's a lot of uh, processing power that's going into run the system. Is, has anyone, other than like, I'm thinking like a prime point or something like that, is anyone trying to use that processing power for something else? Um, there's always always the desire to do that, but uh, the proof of work actually has value because it has no other value. 
It's, it's sort of circular in its logic, but the, uh, if it could be gamed, then that would reduce its value as a neutral proof of work. And so, um, you know, from a, you know, ethical whatever perspective, I would certainly love a more efficient system, but I compare the current system to anything that maintains a normal fiat currency, which is data centers, people with guns, lots more people doing accounting, et cetera. And so you have to conglomerate all of that uh, US dollar or yen management and compare that to what we have with Bitcoin, and I think you'll see that it's very, very efficient and cheap compared to those other options. Even if you scale down US dollar volume or yen volume to Bitcoin levels, you'll still see that uh, there's a lot of overhead in a fiat currency. Next. Thank you for putting in the, uh, the unrestricted uh, script stuff. Uh, in your experience, when you have a change like that, they go down to the miners. How long does it take for a change like that to be accepted by the miners? That is an excellent question. And uh, basically, uh, many of the miners are running a custom piece of uh, custom Bitcoin defort. And so it takes a little bit longer than just your average software release. But uh, so there's. Uh, an engineering downside to that in that if we see a bug in the latest release and a miner is on 0.9 rather than 0.10, then it takes them that much longer to catch up to the latest uh, bug fixes and changes. But uh, ultimately, even though the nodes, not the miners, the nodes validate all work on the Bitcoin network, and just as a refresher, you know, whenever you post a transaction, it gets validated three times, first by the nodes, then by the miners, and then by the nodes again when the miners uh, distribute their blocks. And so the nodes are really a check and balance for the miners. And uh, that is uh, very healthy for the ecosystem, but at the same time, miners do control some part of the policy. That's the transaction selection policy. And so we want to give them some room for flexibility within that while still maintaining the decentralized aspects. Follow-up on uh, Mike's question there. Here's the Bitcoin satellites. Uh, how do you decide which version of the software the satellites are going to run? And is there the possibility of a conflict of interest there if the owner of the satellites wants to run a slightly different version than the miners and the majority of those are going to um, absolutely. And uh, the, my, the satellites are really a backup. It's not a, this is not like a new trusted layer or anything like that. And so if the satellites are running one policy, as long as it's compatible with the Bitcoin network and the miners are running a different policy, that's just fine. As to who controls it, it's ultimately the uh, owners of the satellites themselves. Now, DSS, my, my company is going to own most of those satellites, but we're also looking at fractional ownership ownership and uh, other more exotic uh, financialization of them. So if we are not the owner of a satellite, then that owner certainly has a uh, freedom to do whatever they want. It's basically a computer server in space, really. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much for listening to episode 26 of The Bitcoin Game. I hope you enjoyed hearing Jeff talk about his vision for the future of Bitcoin. Jeff seemed like a super nice guy at the event, and I was really excited to get to meet him and hear him speak. Sorry the questions at the end were sometimes inaudible, but I think Jeff's answers filled in most of the blanks. Don't forget you'll find relevant links and more in this episode's show notes. Just go to thebitcoingame.com and look for episode 26. See you next time.